So this session is uh, titled Panel on What Healthcare Will Look Like in 2020. So at least we know it's a panel. And it's uh, titled Disruptor. So uh, we, got, uh, we got some uh, great people here. Let me tell you a little bit about them. I don't have a table, so I got to juggle here. Uh, we've got Tim O'Reilly directly here to my right. Tim, uh, if you haven't caught his, uh, his talk, uh, keynote talk yesterday, he's ta thought a lot about bringing this whole space together, this community. Uh, he's the founder of O'Reilly Media. Uh, we have Ben West right next to him. Ben is uh, the creator of uh, Insul Audit, and he's done this uh, really amazing job of, of effectively hacking the device, of glucose monitors, getting all this stuff to talk together, actually uh, thinking about standards of data, and we'll get more into that. Uh, and we've got uh, John Madison, uh, and John is the chief medical director of Kaiser Permanente. He's a fellow alumni of UCSD. In fact, we uh, also did, we just learned we're both doing a lot of marine biology back in the day. And uh, also notable, he uh, was probably, were you the first person with a med creating the first electronic health record in 84? Or is it, were no, people I, actually writing something even before that? It was, it was an early one, but there were folks who had them even, believe it or not, in the 1970s, early 70s. Wow. All right. Yeah. So 70s stuff was already going on. So to, to start things off, you know, these, Just oh. One, maybe, maybe, John, do you want to say something here? Oh, yeah. So, um, Given that this is a conference about health, uh, and given that last week there was a study published showing that uh, excessive sitting is associated with a twofold risk of diabetes, uh, all other factors being held equal. So, so the more sitting you do in the day, um, you double your risk of diabetes. So I want everybody to stand up now. If you could just take a quick diabetes stretch, anti-diabetes stretch. And now, there's a couple people in the back sitting down. Come on, stand up, put your arms up, stretch a little bit. Okay, now, next exercise. Pick up all of the stuff that you have scattered all over the table in front of you. Just pick it up and put it in your hands. Okay, now that you're standing and you have all of your stuff in your hands, those that are back, further back than the fourth table, please come forward. <laughs> it's your anti-diabetes walk. There you so go. Come, come to the front of the room. Ash and Ann are going to help you find your way up to the first four rows of tables. Thanks, Ash. That's, Bring him. That's right. Okay, this is a demonstration of the fact that uh, uh, hacking healthcare starts with hacking society, hacking social <laughs> rules. Uh, per pervasive data, per pervasive knowledge, pervasive action. So, if we were really right. good at hacking, we would have just turned off the Wi Fi and that back portion. Come on, keep that. coming. Let's do it. Okay. Keep coming. Let's keep go. Coming Come on. Up. You're on your feet. You have your stuff. Let's uh, go. You want, you want the that's, panel that's to get right. going? Come forward. Okay, we're we'll leaving. Turn, we'll turn down the volume. All right. <laughs> so, it, the great, I, I'm going to try those diabetes stretches. I would try them on the plane, except I'm afraid that uh, I might get tackled <laughs> as I. <laughs> the, so, to, to start the session off, and we're going to open it up, so please be thinking about questions is, you know, it's often this time when you talk about pontific pontificating about what is the future going to look like in some specified time period like 2020. I thought what it would be great to start off with is, what do we want healthcare to look like by 2020, or maybe even sooner? And so kick that off. Tim, what, do you, what are your views? Well, kind of summing up a lot of what I've uh, heard at the conference uh, and thinking about uh, with this notion of how do we sort of close the loop between data having algorithms to detect interesting things. I don't want to call my doctor anymore. I want my doctor to call me. Tweetable. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> ben. Uh, well, I guess what I would say is uh, it'd be great to per be able to pursue uh, my therapy engaged with my healthcare team and be able to, uh, to, to work together to know that we're using science to drive therapy. So a collaborative environment? A collaborative environment, uh, increasing the kind of fidelity of care. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't really either want to have to call my doctor or wait for them to call me. What I'd really like to do is have a continuous stream of data about me that's intersecting with a continuous upgrade to the uh, knowledge of what's uh, good for me um, and that have that intersection surface in a way that's really available and accessible to me so that I can know what my options are uh, and what the consequences of my options are. And one of the, one of the things I like to think about is, you know, the, the riddle of the Sphinx where... Um, you know, what walks on, you know, four legs and then two legs and then three legs with a cane in later life. 
and is actually have a visual projection of what your life is like based upon the decisions in front of you and how will your duration as, a, as an upright, healthy looking um, uh, image uh, last longer and healthier based upon the decisions you're confronted with at every moment, based upon your personal fingerprint and the best information about health um, and the behavioral choices that you make. So you're at Kaiser, one of the well-regarded places, highlighted by many places as, as one of the people that are doing some of the most innovative work with, with data. What's, what's holding us back from doing that today? There's a lot of existing inertia, and I think uh, uh, Tim and, and uh, Vinod uh, alluded to this earlier, is why is there so much innovation going on in the third world right now ahead of us? They don't really have the inertia of the, um, the institutions and all the financial incentives that are driving a lot of the perverse behavior. So a lot of people refer to um, the health systems today as being dysfunctional. They're actually very, very rational. They're responding to, to some very dysfunctional incentives. And so, uh, uh, the Paul Levy had a great quote on his blog, which I quoted <laughs> yesterday, which is, uh, yeah, why did everybody say the U.S. health system is inefficient? It's actually twice as efficient as ext at extracting money from, <laughs> from the system as, as other parts of the world. <laughs> exactly. <You know>? And, <laughs> and, and <laughs> so one of, the th one of the things that, that uh, one of the reasons that I'm at Kaiser Permanente and the genius of uh, Sidney Garfield, the founding physician uh, in Kaiser Permanente, did is align the incentives so that we have the ability to think in terms of how do we get the most value for money? How do we get the best outcomes? How do we use preventive medicine to achieve the outcomes that we get? And we lead in almost every objective third-party category around achieving outcomes. So yeah, every so day... Tom Park said recently at the health conference, he said if, if, we just, if the rest of the country had uh, Kaiser, you know, end of discussion on health crisis. It, yeah. it, it's, we're, it puts us in a position to accelerate... The, the cost crisis. Right, to accelerate both <laughs> quality outcomes as well as cost reduction. But the question you asked me is, why aren't we doing all this stuff today? Actually, we have hundreds of innovation projects in the pipeline right now where we're testing all of these things, including health avatars. Um, we we uh, have a project where uh, patients who... Um, are struggling with morbid obesity, they need to lose 10% of their existing weight before they qualify for bariatric surgery. So we're giving them aspirational avatars of what they'll look like after surgery so that they can begin to think and project themselves into how much better it would be to help motivate them to lose weight. So we have literally scores and scores of innovation pilots like that underway right now. So there's, there's a big misconception about innovation, I think, pervades you know, healthcare and industry right now, and that is a great idea and you're done, but scaling... Um, and diffusion and operationalization is really challenging. So um, the, the, the biggest barrier we have between hundreds of innovation projects, literally, and scaling and diffusion across the entire organization is that long, laborious, tedious 99% perspiration um, that has been alluded to um, with the 1% inspiration being the idea. So there, there's a whole lot of hard work to get from that initial pilot. Okay. So, to diffusion. So if we really take that as, in this kind of avatar in this session, Ben, you spent, you spent some time at Second Life and building, really focusing on how to build these communities and avatars and one of the first places to actually really use that term, or at least popularize it. Uh, how do you think about this stuff, especially in the group structure that you work on where you're trying to really help one of what is one of the most tight-knit groups out there uh, of people with uh, chronic disease, which is diabetes? Um, sure. Well, I, the, the concept of avatars um, is, is a compelling one. Uh, avatars or an agent um, is something that maybe it's, a, maybe it's a robot or a piece of software, but it's representing my uh, interests. And so Evan Moglin has a great set of talks about um, how robots, we all kind of assume that robots are designed to protect us and do us no harm. And in reality, robots are just programmed what they're programmed to do by people that are just as fallible as any other people. And so uh, a great part of this is getting access to, uh, getting, getting access to the data, getting access uh, to the details of what's going on. Um, and the, the, the idea of, of avatars representing all of, all, every, every, there might be an avatar representing my insulin pump, another one for my glucose meter, another one for my doctor, and as he said, maybe the intersection of all of these um, is, is a very exciting thing. So, and, and we were just talking about, uh, about another particularly interesting avatar would be one that if I'm in trouble, it actually tells the stranger next to me how to save my life. So something, like, something along those lines, uh, avatars could be very exciting. 
Tim, you were sitting here yeah. uh, to, to earlier this morning talking with Vinod Kosla, and um, one of the provocative statements is that uh, robots, algorithms replace a physician. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly think there's a, we have a, a cognitive bias from, you know, a thousand years of history driven by literacy to think that humans consuming information, uh, you know, digesting it, thinking about it, uh, sharing it, uh, you know, verbally or, you know, through various kinds of media uh, is the dominant paradigm. And I, I really do think that we need to start getting used to the notion of information really disappearing into services. Now, I have a slide that I use in some of my talks where I show the Google Autonomous Vehicle with the caption, this used to be a book. You know, it, it was a book of maps, you know, an atlas. And then it became an interactive interface where, you know, first it was just online and then it became more interactive and there were more layers. And eventually it's just like, you know, you start imagining, you know, telling your car, take me to Joe's house or take me to the market. And, you know, the information has just disappeared into the service. And I, I do think the same thing is true in a lot of ways for healthcare. While I kind of, I, I get where you guys are going with the notion of avatars and agents, I also think that the agent that will be most interesting is the one that is invisible most of the time. I mean, the last thing we want is, some, is a nag. You know, you think about the, the, kind of the agent of the voice on your, your car navigation system, most people turn it off. You know, and uh, so kind of like the way that, that, that like this sort of health tracking will sort of disappear, the health tracking and monitoring will sort of disappear into a system that simply says, hey, you know, I actually might even be controlling my, you know, my cooking. You know, it's like, you know, I've ordered the food that you, <laughs> you know, that you should be eating or, or whatever. You know, I, I think there's sort of a whole lot of interesting things that we ought to be looking at in the area of, how do we change the interface that we have to all of the things that are making us unhealthy? All right. So, so um, I think you've, you've opened um, a, a whole lot of opportunities um, with, with two notions. One is using technology to hide the complexity and make it more uh, accessible. And the other is, um, as far as we are down the path of evidence-based medicine, we're in the Stone Age of evidence-based behavioral change. And so to the extent that we use technology to both hide the complexity and learn and create the evidence basis in a mass customized way, it's about what levers do you need to pull for me? Does nagging, what, when does, under what circumstances for what type of objective does nagging work and in what circumstances is it counterproductive? And so I, I, I see that there'd be very task specific kinds of behavioral levels levers that can be pulled to motivate us to do the right thing. In some cases, it may resemble nagging. In other cases, it may be something where you have an avatar, avatar that's in the image of your daughter saying, Dad, you promised me you're going to wear your seatbelt. Dad, you promised me you're going to stop smoking. That, that's not really necessarily nagging, but it's an appeal to a contract that you have with you know, a loved one. And, and so once we have the ability to measure and understand what motivates the individual, how we can mass customize the fingerprint of the levers that work for you in task-specific chores, and we can hide that complexity, I think that we'll be able to support healthier decisions and address the, the disorders of lifestyle that are causing these epidemics that are driving up costs in healthcare right now. I, I want to switch gears a little bit, and, and uh, especially since this is, we're talking about data, data and health, We've seen this powerful notion of democratization of data and how people access data. And when we think about that and, and creation of these different systems or what we can do for either evidence-based medicine or creating behavioral change, what, what are the, some of the, the, the big things that we should be thinking about on the horizon to make that a reality? Uh, ben, maybe you could kick us off here because you've been actually working at, on this at the, at the hardware level. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, well, I started with uh, uh, one day I thought it'd be cool. I'm, I'm a programmer, so maybe it'd be cool to have some time series data that I should work with. And so I kind of went down this path of um, investing in the things that I have nearby. And so I took a look around in my life and I said, aha, I'm diabetic. Here is time series data. I take blood glucose measurements all of the time. It would be really great to develop a really nice set of tools. 
And so, uh, so that's exactly what I started doing. I just started engaging with the resources and the things that I had available with me. And that's something I think everyone can do. When, when I, whenever I go to the hospital, I ask, um, can, I, can I get a copy of the medical records? And whenever I get something back that another machine cannot read, that means that they're essentially asking me to type it back in. So I spend a lot of time combating just transcription errors, which is just any time there's a possibility for any mistake to take place because I'm transferring this data from one medium to another one, there's an opportunity for some kind of transcription error there. Is so, it transcription error, or is it, is it, or maybe you could clarify that for this kind of diverse audience, the transcription error issue versus just raw data incompatibility? So that, yeah, I may be overgeneralizing a bit. One, one class, right, is where I, I have to type it back in, and because I read it off the page wrong, I typed it back in wrong. But another is where um, maybe the hospital upgrades their software, or a business associate of my doctor upgrades their, so, their software. And because they are manipulating my personal health record um, and they've deployed a new feature that has a bug in it, perhaps they've tainted it somehow. So that's another, that's another error that, um, that would be great to uh, just kind of banish by 2020. Yeah. Could yep. I jump in on um, the notion of uh, data democratization and access to data? And that is to point out a lesson from open source software, uh, which is that a relatively small number of people actually, you know, we'll take the code, download it, uh, modify it. Uh, but what openness enables is a whole new kind of innovation. You know, the fact is I don't have to get into the bowels of my medical record and understanding all the science and, you know, getting all the data out and making it meaningful to myself. You know, again, that's sort of this notion that somehow it'll be like, well, we'll, we'll be kind of looking at more and more data uh, as opposed to, I can then expose that to services that uh, will be, you know, built to use that data in creative ways. And there's this whole revolution that's gonna come when we have open data because there are gonna be all these creative people who are gonna say, okay, I can build a service against that. Uh, and then all of a sudden we have kind of the health equivalent of you know, the, the iPhone as open platform where you know, who would have thought that you'd be playing a game like Angry Birds on your phone? There'll be some crazy ass uh, application that comes up that everybody uses that, you know, uh, you know again, the, the phone became not just a communication device but an entertainment device in a very unexpected way. And I think we'll have you know, health effects in the same way. We get all that data, we make it open, and bingo, you unleash an entrepreneurial firestorm. So how do we avoid data vomit there? Yeah, I, I mean, the fundamental thing is like, right. so I get my, I, I went it's in like the how do you we avoid the blink tag in the early days of the web? You won't. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but, but at the same time, right, there's this challenge of, you know, I, it's, so I go into Kaiser, I, I, I didn't do this at Kaiser, but I, I, so suppose I get an MRI and I say, great, okay, here's a flash drive or here's a hard disk, give me my data, and then I go home and I go, oh crap, what am I supposed to do? Do I open this in VI or Emacs, or do I, do I just, what do I even search for on these things? And, and how is that, how are you guys thinking about how that space evolved? Because at the end of the day, this is coming off your guys' systems. So uh, as a whole, Kaiser Permanente has invested heavily in the development and support of national and international standards for data representation. So uh, that goes uh, from the DICOM standard to the uh, clinical document architecture, um, SNOMED. Uh, we donated uh, our CMT work, which includes a mapping of consumer grade uh, ontologies and terminologies with professional grade terminologies and ontologies so we can actually begin some normalizing of the data. So we've been very actively involved in the standards world and I think to Tim's point, it's those open standards that allow for more distributed innovation. We can build on top of open standards and there's a great opportunity for value-added resellers to build applications on top of open standards. Classic example, first billion dollar example being uh, Red Hat and Linux. And so there are multiple opportunities to build on those standards, monetize them, and bring additional value. But the point I'd like to re return to is, if you look at what uh, Virad Kozla said, that he's a participant in the multi-omics study at Stanford, and he's gonna have 5,000 um, uh, biologic parameters reported to him every six weeks. So ironically, Sun um, sort of pioneered the aphorism that 
the network is your computer, and I like to refer to uh, the next generation of that, and the network is now our brain. And even today, it is impossible for a single physician to have all the information in their brain that's relevant about either the universe of knowledge relevant to an individual or the universe that's known about that individual, much less the intersection of everything we know about that individual and everything in the universe of knowledge. So today it's a problem that we cannot do that intersection effectively between our two ears. As amazing as the human brain is, it is insufficient to that task. Now you add in all the omics. And you stream all the omics, whether it's proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, uh, or genomics, and the volume of information that's relevant to an individual decision is huge, and the interplay, the reason genomics is not deterministic, it's only probabilistic, is because of all the complex interplay, both between the protein products and all the microRNAs that actually regulate expression and the tertiary conformation of the genome, yada, yada, yada. So what's happening is the volume of relevant information is already vastly exceeded the capacity of the human brain to manage, and the omics are going to amplify that by several orders of magnitude. So how do we take that information and present it to a consumer, let alone a doctor, and say, these are the three options we recommend, and this is why we recommend them. So what I see is the visualization, um, the, the, the really elegant visualization tools that are emerging to present essentially heat maps. Here's the three options. Here's the benefit, risk, and cost profile of each of those options, and here's what you'll look like 10 years down the road if you follow one of these th each of these three options. And then the question becomes, okay, so I get that. You're simplifying the technology. You're making it easier for me to make my decision based upon the visualization of, of condensed and simplified information that's in a form that I can actually make sense of it. And then the big question becomes what I call the black box economy. And what I mean by the black box economy can best be illustrated by um, the credit default swaps, um, which caused the uh, global financial meltdown. And these are valuable derivative instruments that have a, a useful purpose. But because there was not transparency into how they were managed, and because there was not transparency to what existed within a particular package, a lot of misinformation led to a lot of bad decisions in an economic meltdown. Similarly, when we have these really sophisticated visualization tools that take all of the existing information about you and the knowledge of, of the universe and all of the omics and say, here's the three things we represent to you. How do we know that we can trust that? If there's five different um, visualization tools and underlying algorithms that come up with comp competing information, and as someone mentioned uh, this morning, they got very different information from one of the uh, omics, uh, consumer-grade omics uh, engines than a different one, illustrating that hypertension, uh, John uh, mentioned this, that, that, that in one of them completely misses risk for hypertension, the other one said, you've got a high risk of hypertension and here's the things you need to do. How do we have the kind of certification, transparency, and trust into the multiple options? But and, you know, John, there's one thing that's really interesting when you talk about trust. It seems to me that there's uh, a whole set of questions about, well, whose algorithm do you trust because this one recommends this path, this one recommends the or other path. That, but the, but the, other, the other real deep question is, uh, you know, what is their motivation? Because Absolutely. somebody might well say, well, my <laughs> algorithm is actually designed uh, to extract some money from you and not to actually uh, do the best thing for your health. That, that's that's, that's a, to me real, a really brilliant big, question. A really big risk right. in the in the future. Brilliant right. question. Like, like, who, right. We who, talked who? about the agent, these agents and these black boxes uh, disappearing, and how do you trust um, mm -hmm. once that feature once it disappears from you? How do you trust it? And that's really where the empiric access comes back in. The scientific method demands that you get empiric access, uh, empiric access to this thing. You tweak that knob. You turn that feature on and off, and you see what the difference is because you should be able to measure the evidence. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if the algorithm is open, then anyone can review it. So in terms of which one do you want to use, it's probably the best reviewed one, right? right. Before we uh, get to questions in just a minute, real, real quick, what, you know, 2020, you want your tricorder, you want something that's just a Band-Aid transmitting data. What do you, what do you want for, for a system to be telling you about yourself you obviously want the doctor to page you when something's there. What, what's a device that you want to see have? Well, I'll go. I want no, no wires. No wires. Yeah. <laughs> no transcription errors. 
So I, I like to draw a parallel with the, the technical stack, you know, and, and, and the various layers of the technical stack, that there's, that there's also a stack from data to information to knowledge to wisdom to action to evidence base influence to values to health to wellness to happiness. It's a much longer stack. And those of you that haven't read Harvard Business Review uh, January, February this year, it's all about international metrics around uh, happiness. And so if we look at what we're really after, um, I think we're really after higher levels of wellness, higher levels of resiliency of our communities. Um, and we need to have metrics that actually tell us what's working for the community, what's working for the individual to bring about higher levels of health and happiness. And um, in, in that frame of reference, mindfulness becomes really important. So do I really want to know every bit of data from my Fitbit every single day? Or do I want to challenge myself to become more mindful and say, you know, I'm only going to check my Fitbit at the end of the day, and I'm going to guess how many steps I've taken a day, and then extend it to a week, and then to a month, so that you begin incorporating it so it becomes subconscious, and you're actually, through mindfulness... Contrasting observations with predictions. Yeah. Exactly. And I also want to have a mashup of my Fitbit and my Pandora radio station so that I can have my avatar tell me which radio station I need to listen to right now because my cortisol level is a little bit higher and my pulse is a little bit higher I at that, that moment. I think a Greylock company. We love so it. I, <laughs> so I could actually... So what? I said there's a Greylock portfolio company. We love it. Who's, who's there you that? go. Pa Pandora. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, okay, got it, yeah. But Tim, what about you? You, you, you uh, mentioned one earlier about... Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I was just sort of joking when we were, we were backstage that uh, <laughs> I want my toilet to tell me that how much money I wasted on my vitamins that I took this morning. <laughs> how expensive my urine is. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, again, the notion that uh, is really interesting to me is monitoring that is not something that I'm paying attention to uh, but that is paying attention to me and that alerts me uh, when I'm in trouble or that I can check, you know, in the same way, you know, we're not sitting there driving, looking constantly at the speedometer. You know, we are generally looking and we use our ambient awareness, but we, we periodically check it and we educate it by looking at the speedometer. So I kind of want a bunch of speedometers. But you know what I want more than anything else? I want a system that allows this kind of technology to flourish. And what I worry about is that we still have a system in which the incentives are designed uh, to make money uh, for a set of players. And that's everything from, you know, the incentives in the healthcare system. But, you know, again, how crazy is it we have an obesity epidemic and we are subsidizing corn syrup? I mean, you know, we literally have uh, a system in which we are, uh, we have, uh, you know, we are actually paying to do bad things to ourselves. And uh, we have to actually take a systemic approach, not just to healthcare, but to society. Great. Let's take some questions. Yep. So one of the things that manufacturers learned over the last couple of decades of automation and data deluge is the worst thing you can do is go out on the floor and constantly tweak the knobs. And there are a lot of twitchy people out there that as they get more and more apps and they're flooded with more and more data about themselves are tempted to tweak their own knobs to right. their own Yeah, so the question is effectively, you've got, you've put out this, we got this data deluge and people fiddle with the knobs of the adjustment of the systems that they're, they're trying to use to digest that system to make action. How do, you, how do you get people to be actually smarter and more intelligent about that? Mayo Clinic actually published a article this year illustrating your point. They randomized uh, patients after a hospital discharge into two study groups. Um, they were matched for their clinical conditions. One of them was assigned to tele telemetric monitoring and the other was not. The conclusion of the article was something like this. The mortality in the group that had telemonitoring was three times that of the control group and we don't understand why. And for those that understand stress, had they measured the cortisol levels of the people getting a beat that said you're sick, you're sick, you're still sick, you're more sick, you're still sick. It's to your notion of too much information is not always a good thing. And it, and it goes to the point of, you know, there's, there's three things that have been identified around, you know, what leads to happiness. It's autonomy, it's competence, and it's social appreciation for what you do. And so to the extent that those are utterly lacking from that study, it's no surprise that the mortality was up threefold. But what we need to do is rather than tweak the dial every two seconds and say you're sick, you're sick, you're sick, 
is to enable the mindfulness that allows them to have the autonomy and the competence to do some things that impact their health in a positive way on a systematic level, not minute to minute, but through mindfulness. That's the missing piece. I, I can't help but mention a comment my father, who was a physician, once made. He, he said he thought that ambulances might have killed more people than yeah. they saved. Yeah, because here you are, you, you have a heart attack, and you're kind of in this screaming. With a siren. Oh, uh, my know, God, yes. <laughs> this screaming vehicle that's telling you, you're about to die, you're about to die. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great. Can we get another question? Yep. is kind of a way to profit, uh, where you've got all this data, you've got uh, all these systems in place, you're acting in a much more integrated way than a lot of the other players, uh, and when is that going to start being reflected in pricing that is just substantially less than you know, some of your competitors, uh, so that you're going to see that market kind of shift more and more in your direction? Uh, well, what's it going to take for you guys to get there? Do you want to rephrase it also? Um, just so for, the, uh, for the audio? Sure. So I'll, I'll try and restate it. So the question is, if we're doing... Uh, so well using technology to improve quality and lower costs, why did his premium go up uh, this last year? And so I can't speak to the exact product you bought and why it went up 20%, but uh, let me just say that the incentive model of our organization is very clear, and, and in every single discussion I've ever been in around policy issues and cost alloc and, and allocation issues, we look at what investment is going to yield the highest quality outcomes at the lowest possible cost? And our opportunities today um, to do more things are essentially infinite. And so we're constantly having to say, what are the things that we can best invest in? And the virtue of having the not-for-profit health plan is that there, is, there isn't a profit. There is, as Peter Drecker called it, a reinvestment opportunity. So we use the funds that we get through our membership dues to reinvest in all these innovation projects and all the enhanced infrastructure and all of the technology to continue to improve the quality outcomes. When does that become too much and what's really driving the cost and how do you draw the line? Well, part of it is market driven um, and part of it is driven by the disorders of lifestyle and, 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 and I don't want to dodge your question but to say that we're very focused on improving quality and reducing costs with every decision we make. That being said, the cost of healthcare everywhere is way too high for a lot of different reasons. And even though we escape some, some of the per perversity of the fee-for-service world, increasingly employers are demanding that we offer high deductible products, which is going in the wrong direction, if you will, from the incentive model. But um, I think the, the important thing to know about one of the biggest cost drivers of healthcare in this country to where we're at 18% of GDP now really is around disorders of lifestyle. And until we can have much more of a community-based approach, a community of resility, community health, it's going to be very difficult to deal with the rising epidemics of obesity and diabetes that are really huge cost drivers. And oh, by the way, heart disease, uh, coronary disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer, are all driven by obesity and disorders of lifestyle as well. So the rising cost structure has a lot to do with the disorders of lifestyle. And we were talking at our uh, uh, session before, one of the problems we have as a nation is that in order for, and we do a lot of community investment and, and look at community health, but um, the prisoner's dilemma tells you that if one health system delivers much more community value to the entire community and others do not, the winner in the prisoner's dilemma is the one that doesn't contribute to community health. So, so they're, 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 there's this trade-off between market dominance and market penetration and the ability to invest in the community and realize the return on that investment as opposed to that being realized by a, a okay. competitor. Let, yeah. Just to keep, so we keep, we keep moving, I know there's a bunch of, there's a, another, let's, wherever the mic is. So for the last couple, uh, two days, we've been talking about the good that can come out of the data and the technologies that we're working on. But there is also the bad that will come with that. Uh, so for example, I'm a computational biologist and I work on the complex networks that Lee Hood was talking about today. And as we understand how these networks work in the, uh, in the case of many diseases, 
we'll also gain the knowledge and ability to manipulate these networks to create additional bad things, not only to hopefully cure disease with it. So what do you think that uh, we can do to, uh, to mitigate this risk? Ben, how about you're hacking the devices, putting, allowing people to put data together in new novel ways. What keeps you up at night? Um, well, the, uh, the uh, I wouldn't quite phrase it that way. I guess the, the, we were talking about uh, there, there is a certain amount of loss. Uh, for example, my, my pump actually ha is, has a, a protocol that is not secure. So actually anyone in this room could be operating my pump at the moment, and I wouldn't necessarily know about it. Um, in practice, seriously? that does not, yeah, no seriously, box. seriously. Wow. However, that does not keep me up worried at night, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not worried generally about someone. If someone wants to hurt me, it'd be much easier to just walk up and smack me in the face. <laughs> so, that, I don't, I don't, uh, there, there, are, there are some serious concerns. We, what we were talking about is the loss of um, privacy, though, when, these, when those things happen, right? And um, pretty much, uh, there's, there's, there's some sense that privacy is, is, is dead to some extent. And to some extent, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and what I think is important is that if you can't give me a shield, you need to give me a mirror. You need to give me tools so that I can see, at least, what, what am I being exposed to? Who is collecting information about me, and what are they doing with it? At least give me a mirror, give me a tool so that I can see for myself and then maybe I can use that tool to adjust my own behavior, maybe avoid adverse effects, avoid dangerous situations, so on and so forth. I, I think that's a great it's, way to think it's about always it. The users, it's always the user who is up, it's always up to the user to cross. When you, when you, when you grow up, your mother tells you to cr look both ways before crossing the street. And that really never changes um, when you grow up. It's always your own responsibility to stay safe. Hey, that's a real on... tweetable line. So yeah. tell, tell everybody what your Twitter handle is if you're on Twitter. Uh, I'm actually not on Twitter. No, it's not on Twitter. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, so, so Tim, you've been, I think it, it is a great line of having a shield and, and, and instead of a mirror. And, and I, you know, you've been working on this in the, the pushing this in the government space, pushing, you know, we got the great initiative for those that haven't actually signed yeah, the, yeah. the letter. How do you think about that? Well, I mean, for me, the, the, I, I'm, everybody I know except sort of rabid privacy advocates who sort of feel like they're from another generation gets that in the big data world, trying to keep data from people, trying to keep stuff secret is not a workable model. You know, so I've been just really pushing the notion uh, that what we really need is a model where we detect uh, what people are doing with our data and we figure out, you know, what are impermissible uses and we figure out how to, how to sort of catch and punish them. It's a lot like insider trading. You know, you're not prevented from knowing the data, you're prevented from using it. And what are the things that we don't want people to be able to do with our data and then, you know, track it and, and, uh, and stop it when that happens as opposed to the notion that somehow we can build the Maginot line and keep data. And, and as we've seen throughout this conference, there's so much benefit from sharing data. Uh, I'd much rather see us take some risks on the side of oversharing and uh, as opposed to you know keeping everything ultra secure, isn't that in conflict with your idea of the black boxes? Because you know just like the credit fault, default swap issue, I've got black box A against black box B, and they're wrecking havoc. So uh, my my notion of a black box economy is that that's a an unintended consequence of the benefit that we get from sharing our personal data and and. So why do we accept cookies? Why do, why do we not wipe our cookies every five seconds on, on our personal devices? Because they bring value. Uh, Amazon tells you um, what, uh, what you might be interested in. So there's, there's virtues to that. So the downside of that black box is that unless you have the mirror rather than the shield and you don't have transparency into it, um, it becomes uh, a, an invitation for abuse. And so I think the entrepreneurial opportunity is how do you detect who has your data and what they're doing with it? And if you look at what college professors do for detecting plagiarism, there's a whole genre of software for detecting plagiarism. What we essentially need is healthcare plagiaristic algorithms and tools that allow you to say, who has my data and what are they doing with it? And then I think right. we can actually have a surveillance mechanism where the policy that addresses the abuses of secondary use can be implemented and, and uh, used uh, primarily as a deterrent, hopefully, for those abuses. Great. So with that, we're out of time. I'd like, let's thank our panelists.
And uh, thank you for attending. <laughs>